Edmund Burke was a liberal politician who evolved into becoming a centre-right conservative, at least for the time, after witnessing the destruction caused by the French Revolution in 1709. Although the king had not been executed and the Red Terror had not began when Burke was writing his book on the subject, Reflections on the Revolution in France, he foresaw both events. Burke, being somewhat of a liberal, felt that the defence of freedom was one of, if not the most important role of a government, and that freedom was always under threat and should be protected by law. This is understandable given that he was half Irish Catholic, but my personal view can basically be summed up by a quote from T.S. Eliot. Freedom is a very good horse to ride, but to ride somewhere. I'm pro-freedom, but it's a question of the freedom to do what. I think order and a community with common morality are the most important aspects of a society, and freedom will follow once these principles are maintained. Burke did somewhat synthesise these two perspectives, with his argument firstly that if people don't put restraints on themselves based on religious precepts, then the state will have to put restrictions on them. Burke therefore felt that even the most fundamentalist and dogmatic religious institution could actually be a force for liberty, as it would enforce a strong sense of higher morality and ratination on its attendees. Burke also argued that fear is probably the biggest enemy of freedom or liberty, and argued that if you fear God, this will disappear as you have nothing else to be worried about. As always, Peter Hitchens can put it better than me. A lot of what we see in this crisis now is the triumph of fear. Uh, people are afraid, and people like being afraid more than they're prepared to admit, and also people like being told what to do more than they're prepared to admit. Freedom's not that popular. Uh, fear is not as disliked as people like to let on. The great thing about religion is that it's, uh, it allowed, it, it took fear, as I say, out of, out of, out of politics and out of society. Uh, again, Edmund Burke, a man who's, who truly fears God will fear nothing else. And if, you're, if you genuinely believe or can persuade yourself that it's enough of a likelihood to bet on uh, that death is not the end, and then your concerns will be wholly different. But once that idea has gone, and I think the 20th century in, in Western countries has more or less killed the idea that death is not the end and that God is supreme in the universe, then you're left with a gap, which is filled in, to a great extent by idealistic politics. And politics is a, to me, it's a sort of form of, of heresy from religion. People engage in it, you know, in, in, for reasons for which people would once have engaged in, in, in religion. They believe that the temporal world can be made, if not perfect, so near to perfect that it's worth a lot of effort to do it. Burke's criticisms of the French Revolution reiterated his long-standing view that religion is an integral part of a civilised society. He sharply condemned the confiscation of church property by the revolutionaries and claimed that their non-religious views were against not only our reason, but our instincts. Burke predicted that if France rejected Catholicism, some uncouth, pernicious and degrading superstition might take the place of it. Indeed, what Hitchens is referring to in the clip is that Burke discerned clear religious features in the French Revolution. As the revolution turned more radical and entered into its internationalist phase, Burke thought of it as no mere exercise in extending the French rule, but instead as a crusade to destroy Christianity in Europe. In a drunken delirium, Burke wrote, France risked uncovering our nakedness. Burke believed that from a European perspective, only Christianity offered the possibility of social and political improvement. Burke said that morality and Christianity could not exist without one another. He felt that only institutional churches can effectively uphold these sublime principles and enable the fulfilment of man's obligations to both his neighbours and God. Burke also defended tradition in specific terms. He pointed out that traditions are forms of knowledge. They contain the residues of many trials and errors, and are the inherited solutions to problems that we all encounter. Like those cognitive abilities that predate civilization, they are adaptations, but adaptations of the community rather than of the individual organism. Social traditions exist because they enable a society to reproduce itself. Destroy them needlessly and you remove the guarantee offered by one generation to the next. When discussing tradition, he felt that one is discussing answers that have been found to enduring questions. These answers are tacit, shared, embodied in social practices and inarticulate explanations. Those who adopt them are not necessarily able to explain them, much less justify them. 
Hence, Burke described them as prejudices and defended them on the grounds that, though the stock of reason in each individual is small, there is an accumulation of reason in society that we question and reject at our peril. In Burke's understanding, therefore, tradition is a form of knowledge. Not theoretical knowledge, of course, concerning facts and truths, and not ordinary know-how either. There is another kind of knowledge, which is neither knowledge that, nor knowledge how, which involves the mastery of situations, knowing what to do in order to accomplish a task successfully, where success is not measured in any exact or fore-envisioned goal, but in the harmony of the result with our human needs and interest. Good manners illustrate what Burke has in mind. Knowing what to do in company, what to say and what to feel, these are things we acquire by immersion in society. They cannot be taught by spelling them out, but only by osmosis, yet the person who has not acquired these things is rightly described as ignorant. Moreover, they illustrate the way in which higher forms of practical knowledge are acquired and exercised. Traditionalism shouldn't be confused with being a reactionary, which is wanting to return to old forms of society. I think this view is somewhat understandable, but my fundamental criticism of it is that previous forms of society failed, some of them even collapsed, and were replaced by new systems. Indeed, if we were to go back to the 1950s, if such a thing is possible, which is what many in the America First movement want to do, I think we would just end up back at the same place we are now, in due course. I think what the more distant end of the right is lacking is a little bit of vision for the future, which shouldn't be confused with nostalgia for the past. I think the recent local elections is proof of the power of having a vision. People can tell what the so-called conservative vision is at the moment and they are clearly buying it, but it's very difficult to say what the Labour Party stands for these days. Whatever politicos working in head office think is a good idea based on some graphs is my best guess. Totally ingenuinely putting up flags everywhere to dismiss the anti-British accusation comes to mind. Ending on a religious point as I like to do, I've heard edgy atheists totally dunk on Christianity by pointing out that eating shellfish is against Mosaic law. Whilst this may seem a little silly today, in Moses' time this law made sense because shellfish at the time could not be prepared in a safe manner, and eating it could make someone seriously ill or possibly even kill them. The Israelites of Moses' time had implicit knowledge against certain practices, which they derived from religion, but in a eugenic sense, these traditions were effective because they stopped people from going down the wrong path. 2 Timothy 3.16-17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Scripture doesn't contain all the answers, as by nature we have been given free will. I think one can only discover their true purpose through a direct relationship with the divine, and I've seen plenty of evidence in my own life that God exists, because there have been events in my life that I cannot explain in any other way, which I may one day discuss. I think this whole issue is a question of following God. Psalm 23 verses 1-6 to say, The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. But the Psalms also warn of what happens when we don't follow God. Psalm 917 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Only through true ties to God, which give us true morality, as well as ties to our past and to our kin, which dictate not only our relationships with one another as the family of believers, but also the shared experiences which dictate how we should live, can we defeat the destructive mind virus of neo-modernity. God bless, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe.